one of the attributes of finite impulse response filters is that optimization techniques can be used to design them. And in this particular lecture, we're going to look at use of the minimax criteria, where it's finding the minimum of the maximum error to design our filters. So we're going to start with the type 1 FIR filter, which recall had M even. The impulse response started at time 0 and went through length M, H of M, and it also had even symmetry. So we had the condition that h at time n was equal to h at m minus n. Now we're going to show how this design procedure works for the type 1 filter, and it can be easily adapted to the type 2, 3, or 4 filters as well. So recall the type 1 filter had a frequency response given by e to the minus j omega m over 2. That was our linear phase factor. And then we had a real valued function a of omega, which was the sum from k equals 0 to m over 2, coefficients a k times cosine of omega times k. And the coefficients are related to the impulse response as a of 0 being the middle value of the impulse response, h of m over 2, and then the other coefficients are obtained from twice the corresponding impulse responses. So if we design a filter to find a k, then we can easily use this relationship here to find the impulse response of the filter. The minimax error design criteria is that we choose a filter, in other words, we design the weights a k, so that we minimize the worst case error over some range of frequencies omega in a set f. And we're defining the error here as the difference between a desired response, hd of omega, and our actual response, a of omega, which is a function of the ak's. And then there's a weighting function as well, w of omega. So the hd is a real value desired response. And then hd minus a of omega, absolute value, is going to be the approximation error at frequency omega. And w of omega is a weighting function that allows us to emphasize some frequencies as being more important than others. And we'll call the quantity here that we're trying to minimize the maximum value, we'll call that epsilon of omega. A key result for solving the minimax design for FIR filters is to make use of the alternation theorem. So we're going to let L be equal to M over 2 so that we don't have to write M over 2 repeatedly. And recall that the number of coefficients we have to design is therefore L plus 1 because we had sum from K equals 0 to M over 2. The alternation theorem concerns polynomial approximation theory. And we can write our minimax error cost function in terms of a polynomial in cosine of omega by expanding cosine k omega in terms of polynomial function of cosine omega. In doing that, we can apply the alternation theorem. And what the alternation theorem says is that there are at least L plus 2 extremal frequencies for this lth order polynomial. And we'll let those frequencies be denoted by omega sub k, where k goes from 1 to L plus 2. And at those extremal frequencies, we have the following properties. First of all, the error alternates between two equal maxima and minima. So if I look at the error at one extremal frequency, I have epsilon of omega k, and then at the next one, I have the same magnitude, but a change of sign. So the error alternates between successive extremal frequencies. And then when this property is satisfied of these extremal frequencies, then the error at those extremal frequencies equals the maximum absolute error, which we're going to label here as delta. So that's the magnitude of epsilon of omega k, and that's the maximum over all the frequencies that we're considering in our design set f. So here I've drawn a picture of this, and you can see that we have these alternating maxima and minima in the error, where it goes from 1 plus delta to 1 minus delta to 1 plus delta to 1 minus delta. And then we have 
delta minus delta plus delta minus delta plus delta. So the error is alternating and the omega sub k's, which I've labeled here, are the extremal frequencies. So in this case we have nine extremal frequencies which would imply that L is equal to 7 or M is equal to 14. So our design approach to finding a minimax FIR filter is to take an iterative approach where we guess at some extremal frequencies. We then find a set of coefficients which will have alternating signs at those frequencies and we check whether they really indeed are extremal frequencies and we repeat this process until we find an AK that matches the extremal frequencies we designed here and that's going to give us minimum error at those frequencies. There are several different algorithms that can accomplish this. The most commonly used one is the Parks-McClellan algorithm. and It involves guessing at the initial extremal frequencies, omega 1 through omega L plus 2. Then we're going to find an AK set of coefficients and an error term delta that satisfies the alternation criterion. That is negative 1 to the k, that's going to give us alternating signs in the error. And then we have w of omega k times hd of omega k minus a of omega k. So we're going to find a set of a's and a delta that will satisfy this condition. Now it's convenient to rewrite this condition in a slightly different form and that is to collect all the unknown terms on the left-hand side of the equation and the known terms on the right-hand side of the equation. So here we have a of omega k, which depends on the coefficients a k, plus negative 1 of the k delta, which is also unknown, divided by w of omega k has to be equal to hd of omega k. Writing it this way leads to a system of linear equations that we can solve to find a set of AKs which have alternating error. And we can write those down by concatenating the equations for each K. So this first row of this matrix is when K is equal to 1. and We have 1 times A0 plus cosine of omega 1 times A1 plus cosine of L omega 1 times A of L minus w of omega 1 times delta and that has to be equal to hd of omega 1. Well, We can write the case k equals 2 involving the second row of this matrix and the second entry in this vector on the right and so on and then the l plus second row of the matrix represents when k is equal to l plus 2. So here we have l plus 2 unknowns that we wish to find and L plus 2 equations. So we can invert this matrix to solve for these unknowns and that will give us a candidate set of A's and a delta that have this alternating property. Now the key thing is that even though those A's have and the delta satisfy the alternating property, we don't know whether the true maxima and minima correspond to the extremal frequencies that we chose when we designed the AKs. I've illustrated that here where we have some initial set of extremal frequencies that we began with as the blue X's and those are the omega K's that are used to compute the AKs. And then we find the actual response that's generated by those AKs and that's going to be this black curve here, the sum from k equals 0 to l, a k cosine of k omega. And then what we do is we look at this particular curve and find the true alternation frequencies, which are indicated by the magenta circles. And those in general might be different than our initial guess. If indeed they are different, then we're going to use the new ones as new guesses for alternation frequencies and go back to step two. And then we'll iterate this process until the alternation frequencies don't change. That is, our guess actually lines up with the alternation frequencies of the underlying response associated with those a sub k's, the black curve. And at that point, we'll have our set of coefficients, AK, which we can use to find the impulse response of the FIR filter.
Now, in general, we don't want the error in the pass band and the error in the stop band to be identical. We may have a tolerance diagram that says that in the pass band, I can tolerate ripple between 1 minus delta P and 1 plus delta P. But in the stop band, I have to have attenuation specified by delta S. And these two ranges, delta P and delta S, are not necessarily going to be equal. So that's where the weighting co function comes in. And if we choose unity for the weighting function in the pass band of the filter, then in the stop band, we want to weight by the ratio delta P over delta S. In other words, if delta S is smaller than delta P, that is, we have a tighter tolerance in the stop band, then this weight will have a larger value in the stop band. And that'll result in our design procedure accomplishing a smaller error in the stop band. Now, the other factor that we have to choose in the design is the filter order M. We can't specify that exactly up front, but there are some approximations for low-pass filters, such as the one I've indicated here, that if you choose an M approximately negative 10, log 10, the product of the ripple parameters, minus 13, divided by 2.324 times the difference between the stop band and the pass band, in other words, the transition bandwidth, this formula has been shown to work fairly well for coming up with an initial guideline for M. But in general, you'd test out your design, see if you had adequate performance, if you met your tolerance specifications. If not, you would adjust M accordingly, either increase it or decrease it, until you were satisfied with the design. So one, in general, has to iterate over M as well. This Minimax criteria is extremely useful because it gives us FIR filters with very well controlled ripple in stop and pass bands and we can alter the balance or the strength of the ripple by using the weighting parameter W of omega.